Okay, I think we're ready to go. My name's Louise Walker and I'm a Senior Research Manager at Syria and for Sustrain. Thank you for joining us today for, uh, for today's webinar, which is to showcase some of the winners from the recent Sustrain Subs Awards. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping points. Today's webinar is being recorded. All attendees are in listen-only mode. If you have any problems with your connection or audio, please raise your hand and one of the Syria team will help. There'll be plenty of time for questions during the webinar. Simply type your questions into the Q&A box and state if you wish to direct your question to a particular speaker. We will monitor the questions as they come in. If you click the thumbs up to like other attendees' questions, this helps us to identify the most popular ones. Please share any resources you have in the chat. We'll also conduct some audience polls. More on that later. Please share your views and experiences with us um, using apps as you like. Hashtag subs, hashtag subs awards and hashtag subs champions. We'll aim to finish at 12.30. I would like to say a quick thank you to all our Sustrain partners and supporters, without whom events such as today's would not be possible. So what brings us together today? Since 2018, Sustrain has been celebrating outstanding SUDS projects and recognising SUDS champions who are instrumental in delivering exceptional SUDS. The awards provide a platform to share good practice multi-beneficial SUDs, and to recognise high quality planning, design, construction and maintenance of sustainable drainage. In July of this year, our third biannual Sustrain SUDs Awards celebrated outstanding projects across the UK. Today, we'll get the inside track on some of the winning projects with in-depth case studies presented by the teams involved. Um, and yeah, running order there. And um, today I'm delighted to be joined by Phil Williams, Technical Director of the Environmental Protection Group, Kerry Trimmer, Associate with Elliot Wood Partnership, Michael Shorey, Senior Engineer from the Watercourses Team at Enfield Council, Amanda McDermott of Slow the Flow and 2B, and Bill and Elizabeth Blackledge of Westworld Slow the Flow and to be. So let's begin the first presentation by Phil Williams, Technical Director at the Environmental Protection Group. Um, Phil's project was a regeneration and retrofit small scale winner this year, and the title is The Block Manchester. Judge's comments were, um, it was an unusual small Retrofit blue roof with lots of planting for biodiversity. I'll put um, Phil's details in the chat and hand over to Phil now. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Louise. Um, hopefully, you'll all be able to hear me well. Uh, the someone's just <laughs> literally within the past five minutes decided to dig up the road directly outside of my house. Uh, just perfect timing for, for this. Um, however, I would um, continue on. So um, my name is Phil Williams. I'm technical director at the Environmental Protection Group. Um, the Environmental Protection Group, or also known as EPG, we were established in 1998 and we um, cross a number of, uh, of disciplines. Um, one of our key focuses is sustainable water management, such as SUDS, NFM. We also look at contaminated land remediation, structural waterproofing. We're also expert witnesses and we do a lot of R&D. And the, the project that I'm going to be talking about today encompasses a number of um, these elements. So we're, we're looking at the R&D of, of solutions, sustainable water management, structural water, well, the waterproofing element, 
and monitoring and landscape architecture. EPG has um, authored a number of key, or co authored and co-authored a number of key um, manuals and guidances across um, its 20 years of life. These include the ground gas handbook, um, the structural design of modular geocellular tanks, and, um, and the, the big one of um, the SUDS manual. So we're looking at um, the block in Brumwood. It's within, uh, it's in an area of Marble Street in Manchester. It was formerly in that West building. And it's, it's a combination of two buildings. So the, the, the main West building was um, three floors. And then there's the Lowry House element, which is next to it, which is 13 floors high. Um, the Nat West Bank um, also had a basement. And the basement is where it contained um, the vaults for um, the storage of money and other valuable items. It was built in 1973. So you, and this image shows you exactly what you need to know about the building is a classic 1973 prefab building that um, was done not to a particularly great standard. Um, on the roof itself, it was meant to be um, a flat roof, but it had peaks and troughs through the flat roof. So although from this image, you can see it's, it's fairly flat. Um, if you walked across this when it was raining, there were areas where you'd get your feet quite wet. There was about a hundred mil difference between um, a peak and a trough. There was six number outlets. Um, they were designed to BS12056, and they were designed to uh, take the water off the roof as quick as possible and put them into the United Utilities sewer. The waterproofing was a bitumous hot melt, um, and it's a warm roof design, so that means that the there's uh, insulation on top of the slab, and then the waterproofing goes on top of the insulation. Um, so there is no insulation required on top of this element. Of the outlets I mentioned previously, th three of them were blocked or in extremely poor condition. And one of the unblocked outlets, one of the outlets that was actually working, was passing through the proposed data and server center. And therefore there was a, a, a risk of damage to the, all the electrics in that element. So that was removed. Um, the roof itself is extremely lightweight. So you can see a number of plants on the roof, but the only reason that roof can hold this plant is because there's, a, the, there's a several upstands. So the, the um, structural concrete that connects straight through to the walls and the, the main structural element, the, the areas in between the structural upstands was extremely light. Um, and when this was raining based on 12056, it had a maximum design flow rate of about 32.5 liters a second. What Bruntwood did, so that they, they, they purchased um, both the block roof and um, the, the NatWest building and the Lowry building, they've remediated and regenerated the whole insides of the development and, and have done an amazing job on uh, the building, turning it into um, office spaces, um, individual rooms for rent and um, eating areas as well. There's a nice cafe there. Um, and as part of the regeneration work, we, we worked alongside uh, the, them, uh, Brookwood, um, EPG, Polypipe, STRI and Kisters, as well as United Utilities looked at what, whether we could put on a blue roof on top of the, this um, Paul, this lightweight roof. So the design that we came up with, it has a gross catchment area of 747 square meters. So we've designed it to manage the 100 year storm event, plus 40% for climate change. 
at a restricted rate of 3.5 litres a second. So that's a 90% reduction on the existing design. By going down to 3.4 litres a second, we were able to get the system working with one main outlet and one overflow. As I said, the, the, the roof itself was lightweight, so we've used um, a permavoid cell to hold the water, and that's 85 mil thick. But the maximum allowance of water we were allowed, coupled with the saturated weight of the substrate, was 50 mil. So what we've done is we've designed the system to work to 45 mil. So that gives us a bit of a factor of safety within the system. Um, the 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 substrate above is a is a lightweight. Um, stone light tag substrate and then there's a fire break surrounding the whole of the area um, and then it, it's going to be finished with a wildflower finish and gravel path uh, roots so the first thing we needed to do was repair the existing waterproofing because as i said it, it wasn't in great condition it, it, it'd been down there since 1973 uh, what we did is we, we reviewed it. We felt the best way to do it was actually just install the new waterproofing directly over the top of uh, the existing waterproofing. The problem that that posed is it still kept the falls. So once that new waterproofing was finished, you still had that um, 100 mil fall uh, from one peak to one trough. So then what we used is a poly level, which um, it's a spray applied insulation foam. It's also water resistant, but it currently doesn't have a BBA for being waterproof. So it's water resistant. Um, and what that does is it, it, you're able to level off the roof. Um, so we, we use the poly level to um, reduce those falls. So at the end of the system, the system we did a um a survey of it and we was able to flatten it down to plus or minus 10 mil which was a lot better than plus or minus 100 mil um on top of the the, the poly level we then put in a wicking geotextile and the permavoid um passive irrigation crate system. So what the, the permavoid passive irrigation system coupled with the Wick and Geotextile does is it draws the water. So any water that falls into the, the cell when it rains, it draws it back into the substrate. And what it can do in times of excess water in the substrate is it can draw the water out. So it allows the substrate to, to sit at its optimal field capacity. So it doesn't overly waterlog the substrate, but it also ensures that the substrate is at its optimal levels. Uh, so we we put that in wherever we could fit it, excluding those 300 mil fire breaks and uh, around the the upstands, which caused a bit everyone a bit of a headache. And then on top of that, the permavoid, uh, it was again wrapped along the top in a wick and geotextile and then we put in a substrate the substrate was mainly the um light tag chippings and some small organics um we brought it up to a maximum of 80 mil which is extremely thin for a even a a, a normal wildflower green roof it's smaller than generally we would be able to do we were we used a polysync system, which I'll come to later on, to allow us to get a, away with that 80 mil substrate. The passive irrigation coupled with the polysync allows this 80 mil um, substrate because if we went up, up to 100 mil or even more, the the weight would be far too much for the um, the roof. And then what we did is we then put down wildflower matting. Um, a number of delays due to uh, primarily COVID um, meant that we were laying um, this this matting in the, probably the worst possible time. There's a, there's a heat wave in 
late May. So it was being laid in 30 degree weather and that 30 degree weather was I went on for two weeks, which was quite rare for Manchester. So uh, we went with wildflower mats that were the plants was already established um, to allow it to to bed in a, a lot easier with those temperatures. And then it was just fully watered in um, overnight. The roof itself, the, the finished look of the roof, is, the, the first, the, the image you can see on your right hand side was um, the first year. And then the image you see on your left hand side was earlier this year that this was um, June of this year. And it, the, the, the roof itself is still thriving. And um, is there are a lot of pollinators. Um, you see when you're up there, it is buzzing with bees, butterflies, all sorts of flying insects up there, which is um, really astounding because everything else around the block roof is gray and black. This is just like a green oasis in the middle of Manchester. So the polysync system um, was used to ensure that the, the vegetation su um, survives and allowed us to use that 80 mil of um, 80 mil of substrate. And what else it, um, it's allowing us to do is seeing if we can actually discharge less both um, flows and volume from the block roof into the United Utilities sewer. So the, the principles of the policing system is it, it watches for the weather coming in and it, it has a valve and the valve um, stays shut and it, may, it, it takes constant measurements of the, the tank and, and looks for whatever rainfall is coming in and it makes the decision at what point. So it has a, as a rule, the rule is to keep at, um, at, a, at 40 mil of water within the tank. So if it sees that a rainstorm event is gonna come in and it's going to go over that 40 mil, it will empty the water down. If it sees that that rainfall won't push it over that, 40 mil mark, it will um, it will just harvest that, that water without any discharge to the sewer. So the purpose of this is to harvest storm events, to hold the water in there, to um, passively irrigate the uh, green roof. And it's that passive irrigation, that holding of the water, which allowed us to really thin down the substrate. So the, the polysync system is a, is a creation between EPG, um, Mashup Analytics, Polypipe and Kistas. Kistas are a large data uh, firm from Germany. So we, um, <laughs> we copied this, the, the four pillars of SUDS uh, for this and we, we came up with the, the four pillars of um, SMART. So we're saying that a, a, a SMART system needs to have four key pillars, otherwise it won't work. So the, the first pillar is engineering. You need, you need to have someone who understands how the water system works. So you need to have someone to, who understands how a blue roof system works before you could ever put on a polysync system onto a blue roof, because otherwise you'll be creating a flood risk for yourself. The other one is data and software with everything that's going on in Russia and everywhere else. Anything that holds water, anything that is water involved is currently fair game for the Russians and other hackers, and they will act, uh, actively hack anything that they possibly can do. And if you're running um, a fairly weak system and it's tied into your build and maintenance software, that it, um, a smart system can be a shortcut into your build and management and then or, or into the, the, your bank system. Um, one of the, the things that I know when I, we were researching this is that a Vegas casino got took for a couple of million pounds because hackers got into their bank account details via a wireless thermometer in a fish tank. So it, you really need to be careful with, with, um, with anything that plugs into anything um, within the building systems. The next one is meteorology. So you need to have really reliable um, weather forecasting. Um, 
and it needs to be sort of to a postcode level and it also needs to be um, aggregated across all of the weather forecasting systems not only just the web the met office the met office is really good at uh, westerlies incoming westerlies but anything coming from the east it starts to struggle and that's where maybe french or german um data it, information is more accurate and the technology it just you just need reliable technology within um, your design. So the, the, essentially the principles of the polysync is, is however I mentioned it before, is it makes a decision. The, the, it sees whether the rainfall is coming in, it makes a decision. It, it either lets the water out or holds the water in there. And then one of the key things it does is it then runs through what's known as a digital twin. So it, it sees what actually happens in real life and sees what it predicted to do. And then at that point, it uses AI to tighten it up for the next time around. So, uh, so within, um, it's been up and running for two years now, um, 18 months. And it's extreme. In the first few months, it was fairly inaccurate. There, there was a big um, difference. But uh, this, this year, and some of the graphs I'll show you later, you can, you can see how accurate the policing system is. This is just um, a couple of things that the policing system will be able to provide so it can trigger automatic road um, closed signs if, if it wants to. It can talk to the, the local sewers because it runs on the same network, the same principles. So it can talk to the sewers and the sewers could actually in, in the future say, yes, please discharge to us now or no, we don't want any discharge. We're at full capacity. So it it's feature proof in itself. This is just part of the installation of the, the polysync system. So that what you're seeing there is the sensor into the, one of the main man, the outlet manholes. And what you're seeing on this one is a, um, is the, the, the red curve is the, um, on this graph is the water coming in. And the blue curve is the, the level of um, water in the tank. So what it's done in the first principle is you can see that it's drained down the, the water within the tank in anticipation for that storm to come in. That storm then topped it itself up. But then you're seeing that the water is draining down again. That what's happening there is it's not being actually discharged to the sewer. It's actually being used evapotranspirated by the plants so all this water you're seeing disappear off is not is being used will never go into the sewers is being used by plants is helping them become healthy and thrive but is also um easing the burden on the united utilities system and this again proves that that concept so what the red graph here now shows is um the valve opening so wherever you see a spike, you see, you see that the valve opens. So the valve opened on the 7th and then it closed again some point in the 7th of um, August. And then the water has just um, dwindled away to zero. And that's right the way through the, um, the, the two weeks of August. So what that's doing is it's irrigating the plants when the weather is dry. And this whole amount of water never um, reaches the sewers. I'd like to say thank you, and um, I hope that was acceptable. <laughs> Thanks very much, Phil. That was great. Um, we've got some questions coming through, which we'll we'll save for the Q and A session. Um, we're just going to have to do a quick reset um, of the presentations because we're getting some um, so, some interference in the Zoom. So. I'll just let Susan do that and then I'll introduce our next speaker. Susan, I think we're sorted. So now we're going to hear from Kerry Trimmer, Associate to Elliot, Elliot Wood Partnership. Um, and this is about a new commercial development, any scale uh, winner of the Suds Awards this year, and it features Guildford Crematorium. Judge's comments included 
This was a thoughtful design that really celebrates water and it's a clever design for a sensitive location. I'm going to put some uh, background about Kerry in the chat and hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Kerry. Thanks, Louise. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Kerry Trimmer. Um, I work for Elliot Wood as the an associate civil engineer uh, in our Fitzrovia office. So we've got offices in Fitzrovia and Wimbledon. Um, and we lead a team there to that work on mainly um, external works and, and, and suds the lines for the for the built environment. So the project I'll be talking about today is Guildford Crematorium and our involvement in that. Um, we were awarded the best new commercial development in terms of SUDS. So I'll just talk through a bit about the scheme and, 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 and go from there. So just before we begin a little bit about the project team. So this project was relatively old. So it, it started life in 2016. So it's been operational. It's been built out and has been operational for a good few years now. Um, the ultimate client was Guildford Borough Council. Um, Elliot Wood, ourselves, were working as the civil and structural engineers for the project. Um, Haverstock were the architects. Uh, RHB did the M&E engineering. And um, Plinky, who we worked closely with, were the landscape architects who really sort of um, we saw the SUDS scheme through together, uh, working quite collaboratively. Um, and Buxton were the principal contractor. So just a bit about the site location then, it's obviously the clues in the name Guildford Crematorium, um, but it's slightly outside of Guildford um, to the south, more towards Godalming, as you can see on the uh, right hand side there. So the existing site, so it was a fully functioning operational crematorium before we got involved um, in 2016. So in the centre of the site there, you can see the existing crematorium building um, with, the, with a greenish roof. Um, it's quite higgledy piggledy in terms of the arrangement and wasn't really fit for purpose. Um, the bottom right hand corner there shows it was relatively outdated in terms of its look and appearance as well. Um, so needed a bit of a revamp. Um, in terms of the provisions, sort of the infrastructure provisions, um, again, the crematorium has sort of outgrown uh, what they had. So they had sort of combined 60 odd spaces for staff and visitors um, and they it, it was clashing with the hearse routes and everything else. So the arrangement of the infrastructure on the site wasn't wasn't the best. Um, the whole site in its entirety drained from north to south towards an existing watercourse that ran along the southern boundary, as you can see in the uh, top right hand corner there, which was relatively all flowing every time we visited it. So just a bit about the constraints on site, given you, you can obviously imagine with being it a, a, an operational live crematorium, there was a number of constraints we had to deal with. Um, firstly, the distance across the site. So with the proposals, we effectively had to join, drain from point A uh, to the north of the site to the water course, which is around 340, 350 meters, um, which we ideally wanted to do by gravity, but the outfall was relatively shallow as well. So we had to do a bit of gymnastics to get around that. Um, there's also extensive areas of no dig uh, represented by the red circles. Um, these were sort of primarily uh, interred ashes um, and unscattered, unrecorded ashes, which obviously they have to be quite sensitive around. Um, so there's a lot of hoarding and, and protection of them through the works. Obviously, um, a, a very strict no dig policy anywhere near there. Um, and then the third constraint was that the the crematorium itself had to be kept operational um, for a large amount of the, the project. I would say probably 90% of the project it was kept operational. Um, even when demolishing the existing building, um, they had a, a temporary chapel erected um, to continue services. So the contractor had to be, or well, contractor and the designer had to be quite sensitive to that whole process. So what you see on the right hand side here was basically the, the the finished shot of the the site which probably best sort of shows you what what the proposals were um so starting from top left working our way around clockwise so there was a little staff car park that was retained and was just redressed as part of the proposal so the minimal works there um one of the big ones was that they improved the access ways throughout the site 
So um, new access routes and circulation routes for visitors' cars and hearses to keep more of a segregation. Um, and then the bottom right hand corner, you see a relatively large new visitors' car park, um, which more aligned with the needs for the for the crematorium and the number of services they were having on a daily basis. And then the new crematorium building was built pretty much in exactly the same footprint as the old. Um, as you can imagine, with crematoriums, there's certain distances away from roads and, and other infrastructure that you need to be. So it was quite constrained in terms of where that building needed to be. Um, if you haven't seen the internals and, and some of the external shots of the building, I encourage you to visit Haverstock's website. It is quite spectacular in terms of the building, uh, quite innovative in terms of the roof structure. So ha have a look at uh, when you get an opportunity. Um, in terms of the SUD strategy, what we wanted to do looking at the constraints is identify opportunities. So the first port of call was obviously um, improving the runoff rate from the site. Um, free development, it was um, uh, uncontrolled, both in terms of rate and pollution uh, and water quality benefits. I mean, wanted to obviously treat that water before it went back into the into the stream um, to get away to get around the uh, the distance across the site and the shallow outfall. Um, we wanted to use us to convey water as far as we can um, via shallow methods um, across uh, to the southern boundary. Um, and we also wanted to implement a strategy that sort of blended in with the end landscaping proposals um, and was quite seamless and, 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 and invisible to an extent um, to, to blend in with a sort of tranquil feel of, of the site. Just a quick slide on the importance of timing and, and sort of physical presence. So, um, as I say, it was done six years ago and suds were still a thing, but it, they were less of a thing than they are now. Um, so we, one of the key successes of the projects was being at them initial pre-app meetings, sitting down with the architects, and it was quite an old-fashioned setup. We, you know, we all got around the table with A1s printed out, had some tracing paper, put down some ideas, uh, and I think the importance of of us being there and and reiterating the need for suds and and how it can actually benefit the scheme really, um, really cemented that in everybody's brain that it is. It is important it is important for planning uh and the projects as a whole and shouldn't be looked at as just a bolt on to achieve planning um so that's that's one of the key things i think that's probably a familiar message throughout everybody's uh projects so now del delving into a bit more into the side strategy um so i say to get across the whole the whole um depth issues and, and whatnot we use shallow methods of conveyance of surface water across the site so along one of the main roads we used a roadside swale so there's no gullies at all along that that whole swale which the contractor was obviously quite miffed by originally um as it were the ffa but obviously once we explained how it works and there was no need to be worried that everybody was on board um so that swale further downstream had an orifice control, so it was used to attenuate water as well and obviously treat water before it went into the downstream network. Where we couldn't install swales because of uh, width restrictions and whatnot, we installed sort of filter drains and gravel trenches, um, which ended up looking quite nice, as you can see by the top top left hand corner there. It's quite um, you know it's, it's not adverse uh, in, in terms of its amenity value um, it does look quite nice in the end product and one of the key things for us was this uh, car park um, which we used for attenuating um, so the sub base we use 420 mil stone it's a permeable stone um, across the whole footprint of that pink area you see there um, and that was used as a series of orifice plates on the um, on the outlet. Um, so that whole area was used to attenuate surface water, which you can imagine is quite a volume. Um, at surface level, the 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 we had permeable parking bays, uh, but in permeable aisles, and but the the aisles tipped onto the adjacent uh, permeable bays. The contractor, I think, this was their first uh, large permeable car park. So we. We had a number of sessions sort of walking them through um, how to construct it, how to 
how to ensure that it was kept uh, freely draining and once they were on board it was relatively smooth and then we did need some buried um, attenuation um, we tried to avoid it um, as best we could but given as I say the, the site being a crematorium we didn't want to do any design flooding in the 100 year event due to sort of the presence of ashes and flood risk around the immediate vicinity of the building um, so we kept the 100 year plus 40% uh, event in the ground but that needed a bit of below ground attenuation next to the building um, but as I say it was used sparingly and then just to supplement the overall scheme, there were a few reels and ponds um, adjacent to the building, uh, which sort of showcased water as a bit of an asset um, and kept it visible all the time and also obviously fed into the, the tranquil uh, nature of the site. Um, and there were a few rain gardens dotted in, in the internal courtyards um, across the new building. There's just an image of some of the some of the water features in that in that hard standing area adjacent to the main building, um, which I, yeah, as you can sort of appreciate, it lended a bit of a tranquil environment to, to the site. So every device there that I, I went through was linked in some form or another. Um, so we weren't just chucking it all down the system and attenuating at the end. We were every device had a had some form of flow control. Um, offered some form of water quality treatment and stored water um, before sort of trickling down from north to south to eventually um, get into the water course uh, on the southern boundary. So some of the end benefits, we, as I say, we completely omitted the need for pumping, which we would have done if we we uh, didn't use swales and filter drains um, and use the traditional gully system, we wouldn't need a pump, um, which would obviously have um led to ongoing costs and maintenance for the crematorium as well as energy usage um we ended up reducing 70 percent which at the time was relatively good now probably not not so good um but it was in the order of sort of a 50 50 to 60 liters reduction um across the site that we achieved for the 40 percent event um and as i say that we avoided the need for a, a traditional pipe gully network so deep um trenches involved towards the sort of top end of the site um and i say the, the access roads have no gullies in at all um which, which, which was good so we don't obviously on reflection we like to look at the scheme and see how we could have done things better with sort of emerging technology um one of the big ones was well as i said already that we could probably reduce to more than 70 percent um 70 percent was what was stipulated by the local authority at the time but as i say it's 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 six or so years old and old now um but we're very rarely getting anything more than one or two liters a second these days from most of the sites we work on um another big thing which sort of ties into this is um and as phil touched on actually in his presentation the um the emerging technology with regards to combining attenuation and rainwater harvesting so there's probably a, an element that we could have done here um the building does have low flow appliances and there are some tanks for irrigation but we could have maybe combined with sort of the latest systems a combined rainwater harvesting and attenuation tank with smart technology linked to um weather forecasts and whatnot um we're doing uh, a number of these now so we've probably got five or six projects where we're effectively discharging nothing in the 100 year event um so we're sizing the, the rainwater attenuation tank for that event and then that's stored in the building uh, and reused for toilet flushes and whatnot if the demand is there and then it's only when there's a subsequent rainfall event coming that the, the smart technology will tell the tank that it needs to discharge but effectively day to day it is zero liters discharge so that's something we could have looked at um, on this project more for irrigation as opposed to toilet flushing um, and another thing was we didn't really get a chance to monitor um, the uh, statistics of the existing system. So the flow coming out uh, of the existing network into the stream, the quality of water, the air quality in, in the general area. So that's something that we are doing on projects now. 
um, and then obviously implementing flow controls, air, air, air quality monitors, uh, post work to really quantify the benefits of the strategies that we we introduce, and then use that the information that we gather to show to everybody look this is the benefits with that we are having um and also uh, obviously use that as a case for, for presenting uh, stuff to local authority as well so that that's it for me um just to thank you uh for syria and sustrain um there's our nice shiny award on the left hand side there and a nice overview of the site uh and a a bit of a sneak peek at the the building but yeah as i say i encourage everybody to look at the internals as well which were, were quite something um thank you very much you're on mute louise thank you thanks very much kerry that was a really great presentation please keep your questions coming we'll pick them up in the discussion shortly remember to click the thumbs up to like other attendees questions that helps us identify the most pop popular ones. I'm going to introduce the next session now. Please welcome Michael Shorey, Senior Engineer from the Watercourses team at Enfield Council. The project is a regeneration and retrofit large scale winner this year and it's the Four Hills Estate submitted by the London Borough of Enfield. Judge's comments included part of a wider strategic SUDS strategy, good before and after images showing transformation, good adoption of rain gardens as front gardens, simple but effective. I'm going to uh, put Michael's details in the chat now and hand over to, to him. Thanks, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, Michael Shorey. I'm a senior engineer for the water courses team in Enfield Council. I do apologise, I've got a bit of a tiggly throat today, so I might cough a little bit <clears throat> on the key. Um, so I'd just like to sort of introduce everyone to Enfield a little bit first, for those who uh, are not aware. Um, so Enfield Council is, is a little bit different to a lot of London boroughs. We've got three large main rivers. <clears throat> We've got the Turkey Brook, the Salmons Brook and the Pims Brook, which all flow into the Lower Lee. It's a good mix of rural and urban alongside some large industrial areas to the southeast. There is a large fluvial flood risk in Enfield as well as the surface water flood risk. What we're trying to do in Enfield is to use a catchment based approach. <coughs> the rivers in Enfield are very highly channelized and they're disconnected from their floodplains. And because of this, areas downstream are very prone to flooding. So what we have started to do is create basins, wetlands and restore rivers in the upper catchments alongside creating hundreds of smaller suds like rain gardens. The Four Hills Estate is part of the Enfield Town catchment, which has over 2,500 properties which are at risk of flooding. <coughs> Enfield have participated in a project called the London Strategic Suds Pilot, which aimed at, to quantify the multiple benefits of installing lots of suds along the highway. Modelling of implementation of, of a considerable amount of suds at a location provided not only flood risk benefits, but also benefits such as public health and traffic calming. So while the key drivers to suds are always flood risk, there are multiple benefits to consider when delivering your suds project. <clears throat> this is the Four Hills Estate. It's made up of six blocks of flats. It's in Blossom Lane in Enfield. Now, the frontage of these properties is very, very grey, but historically, there used to be grass verges outside the front. These uh, were paved over um, because the old way of thinking was to save on maintenance rather than mow the lawn. Um, we pave it over with asphalt and forget about it for years. And that has left the, uh, the frontage of the estate looking very grey and very unloved. Um, it's not a very welcoming place, or it wasn't a very welcoming place to be. <clears throat> the car park and property frontages used to flood regularly due to the topography of the site. The drainage system was just not able to cope and was getting blocked regularly. This left an unsightly residue for residents and made it difficult for them to get out of their cars and access their properties. As you can see, some of the vulnerable properties that live on the uh, residents that live on the ground floor had up to three steps outside their frontage. <clears throat> The scheme itself took a lot of collaboration. Firstly, we worked alongside our housing team who planned to refurbish all the footways in the area. 
they plan to install two stainless steel ramps for residents who struggled with access into their ground floor property. Housing came to us originally for just advice on flooding, <clears throat> but what we actually came up with was a scheme where we could use their funding for resurfacing and some local section 106 money to develop a sub scheme. Secondly, we liaised with a lot of residents doing two public consultation events to get a lot of feedback from them on what the problems in the area and the site was. <clears throat> Rather than just repave everything like our housing team wanted to do, um, we decided to uh, design a sustainable drainage system which not only solved the flooding issues on the site, but provided some much needed colour and biodiversity to an otherwise grey area. All the design work was carried out in-house by our walk courses team and was exceptionally difficult because the whole project falls north to south but also falls west to east so all the water falls towards the frontage of the properties that's why originally there were steps um, the scheme is, uh, takes over 200 meters squared of roof runoff a thousand meters squared of highway runoff and all of the footway runoff from the frontage of the properties and we have created 18 rain gardens four large detention basins which are fed from 18 mini swells one from each downpipe at the back of the properties <coughs> Residents complained to us during the consultation that they have to walk on um, on the muddy grass verges when they get out of their cars. Um, so during the public consultation, one of the things we've done was we introduced a shared uh, walkway next to um, next to the, the grass verges. We expanded the green area by creating large rain gardens and incorporated a shared crossing point over the existing car parking area. So residents now have a direct north-south route and they don't have to zigzag in and out like they used to um, and walk over all the grass verges. <coughs> um, the uh, estate itself is part of our Enfield town catchment, which is very prone, um, very prone to flooding. Uh, there is significant resi residual surface water flood risk and flood modelling demonstrated that distributing green infrastructure such as rain gardens and basins in this area would help reduce the flood risk downstream. <coughs> the old frontage of the properties <coughs> sorry the old frontage of the properties was being misused for parking motorbikes and not being used for anything other than for residents to access their flats one of the most notable benefits of this scheme to residents was by creating some block paved areas outside the frontage of the properties we created an area which residents have taken ownership of this image shows that the children are playing outside the flats more Residents are sitting outside in the summer and they've stated how it's created a bit of a community as people are now talking to each other and spending time outside for the first time since they've lived there. <coughs> the frontage is now very bright and colourful. It has a great mix of plants and residents have, um, residents have started to put many of their own plant pots out the front and taken to litter picking and planting some of their own plants into the rain gardens, which we encourage as this, this encourages residents to take ownership of the project. Um, then they start to sort of maintain the scheme themselves and when we do future projects nearby it helps with the consultation as eventually we hope the word spreads that the schemes are liked and do exactly what we want and reduce flood risk uh, and make the area just look generally more appealing. <coughs> this image is around the back of the Four Hills estate. It shows that the grass areas were maintained but, but completely unused by the residents. As you can see, all the downpipes are external, which made life easy for us. We have created basins and grass areas and swells to divert the flow from the downpipes. This image shows the sort of in construction phase. You can see we've got granite set aprons, which slow the flow and then they swell down into the detention basins. All the swells and basins were wildflower seeded and have done very well and provided a large variety of colour and habitat. <clears throat> we have divided the basins up into three, creating some weirs, as you can see in this picture here. These are not only doing the job of, of sort of slowing and storing the, the rainwater themselves, but they create access for residents to get across in sort of natural play areas, which we try and incorporate into a lot of our schemes now. At the back of the estate, there is some large green area, which is used as a cut through for commuters to get to the station just up the road. This had created a muddy footpath uh, through the green and into the estate. One of the things that came up in the public consultation was about this, how this looked in the estate. So we tried to improve this by installing a recycled aggregate permeable paving. 
This was saw cut into the grass and laid with no edging. This keeps costs down, but provides a vast improved surface for people to walk on rather than just a muddy trodden footpath. You can also see that right at the back, we used some spoil, which was from the basins to create four hills uh, on the green, which replicated the name of the estate and reduced the amount of waste we had to remove from the project. <coughs> on this scheme, we have used uh, innovative approaches, discharging downpipes onto the paved areas outside the properties. Diverting the water into the rain gardens, something that developers are reluctant to do due to concerns around slip hazards. These concerns are sometimes exaggerated and used as a reason not to deliver shallow green infrastructure suds. Hence why we wanted to do, demonstrate this project that we could monitor and use to promote the approach for future suds projects. We've actually used it to send to developers who say that the falls on the site mean they can't do suds and all the other excuses they come up with. So we've been monitoring this for just over 12 months now and we've had no issues from residents, no complaints. We have also created some overland flow paths on the, on the footway. So where we used to get ponding in the corners of the car park, these now discharge through echo channels into the rain gardens themselves. They're not used day to day, <coughs> but um, during heavy rainfall events, they, they kick in. Um, <coughs> Some of the key benefits for us was to show developers that even on complicated sites with lots of complex falls, we can retrofit suds. So they should be able to design them into their new schemes quite easily. The main day-to-day -day benefits for residents include greening up, enhanced planting and reduced nuisance flooding outside their properties. The scheme has helped create a sense of ownership for the frontage of the properties for residents to make use of the space. The downpipes have leaf catcher attachments at the bottom. Um, this is not what they're designed to be used for, but we've used them to break up the flow. So um, because of the distance to the, the rainwater is falling from the, from the flats, this distributes the flow so it doesn't come shooting out of a pipe and running like a stream across um, the footpath. It actually distributes the flow and you get a nice sort of gentle flow of water during the rainfall then. Um, we have spoken to many residents since and a lot of them have said that there's no issues with the um, the overland flow because basically it's only wet when it rains. There's no storage on the roofs, so all the discharging happens during the rainfall event, and then it just dries naturally like everything else does. So um, when residents don't like to discharge water freely over footways, we've proved that you can do it as long as you're not storing a vast amount of water before you do it so it's not wet after the event. This map um, shows all of the SUD schemes that Enfield Council themselves have led throughout the borough. Um, we've got these are varies of rain gardens, detention basins, we've got 10 wetlands, two river restorations. Um, but by developing these schemes in-house and showing people that they can be, can be done, we've used them as examples, which have led to developers actually developing a, a lot of rain gardens and SUD schemes throughout the borough. The orange dots show all of the developer-led SUDs, which have happened in the sort of last sort of five, six years. Um, so we now um, we now work with developers at the planning stage and advise them on SUDs. And we've, we find that a lot of developers are starting to slowly take it on board. Our comments are getting less and less detailed. So although it's a, it's a very long process, we feel that slowly we're getting through and developers are starting to now submit not just pipe systems and storage systems, they're now starting to incorporate into their landscape design. And so our comments are becoming less and less, but unfortunately not everyone is taking it on board. These are two um, practical guides that um, Enfield have worked with people to develop. Um, Enfield Council have worked with various people and companies to create some practical guidance, which is freely available to everyone online. The first one is a, a, it's a practical guide to designing rain gardens. It has some standard details and explanations of what they do, why we use them and how they can be implemented. And then the second one is exactly the same, but for wetland design and uh, has some wetland management guidance in there as well, which is one of the things we tend to struggle with uh, at the council is main, maintenance. Um, and that's, that's me pretty much. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Michael. Um, keep your questions coming. Um, I'm going to now introduce the next session.
please welcome our final speakers, um, such champion winners this year for Outstanding Team. Amanda McDermott, McDermott from Slow the Flow and 2B, and Bill and Elizabeth Blackledge from Westwold, Slow the Flow and 2B. I'm going to put um, some more details about the team in the chat and hand over first to Amanda. Yeah, I'm Amanda. Bill and Elizabeth and I are obviously a team. Um, we're going to take it in turns to speak. So um, I'm going to talk about Slow the Flow. Um, Bill's going to talk about Westworld Slow the Flow. And Elizabeth will then talk about 2B. Um, Susan, could you? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so Slow the Flow uh, is now a registered charity. Um, and we're concerned with nature-based solutions to um, our flooding problem when we're based in Coldale. Uh, and before I say much more, I'd like to do a little poll, which I think Susan's going to control for me, um, just to see whether people have heard of Slow the Flow and if you have, how you've heard of us. Yeah, great. it's great that some people have heard of us. Perhaps over, over half people have already heard of us. Um, And yeah, it's through in different ways as well. So that's useful. Thanks, everyone. Um, haven't already heard of us. I'll just do a, a bit of an overview. Um, like I said, we're, we're based in Coldsdale, um, which is a steep sided valley in West Yorkshire. Um, we are infamous for the Boxing Day flood event of 2015, um, which is when Slow the Flow first sort of came together. Um, it was, you know, it was a devastating flood event and we've had further events since um, and they're only going to, you know, the, the flooding frequency is only likely to increase due to climate change. Um, but one of the silver linings on that occasion and since is that the community response has been really kind of profound. Um, it's really kind of brought people together in response to those flood events in the cleanup and then also coming together to think about what we can do about it. Um, so, you know, following that Boxing Day 2015 flood event, there were there were um, community cleanups and meetings upon meetings. Um, you know, you could go to a flood meeting every day if you wanted to. Um, and as it all sort of settled down a bit, um, a group of us found each other with um, a shared interest in nature-based solutions and in trying to get something off the ground that um, that would start to address the problem more quickly and in a more agile way than the authorities were likely to be able to do. Um, because, you know, as a group of volunteers, we don't have all that kind of red tape. Oh, hang on, um, go back one. Um, so, yeah, we've got um, some physical projects on the ground. Um, we've got some sudsy, more suds urban sort of projects like the, uh, the green roof on the Flood Warden store in Mythamroyd. Um, and then uh, a lot of what we've done so far has been more rural. Um, the other pictures are of our kind of flagship project at Hardcastle Crags, which is our local national trust site. Um, it's a large woodland and um, as part of their wood woodland management scheme, um, they have been felling trees. So we've been able to use the timber to create leaky dams and contour placed logs. Um, we've done a bit of tree planting ourselves as well. Um, and all using volunteers and um, so people come out every other Sunday to help us and the top left picture is um, one of the important things to us is about monitoring and making sure that we are documenting what we're doing um, and trying to find scientific evidence as to how it's helping um, which has always been one of our um, drivers is to help prove the effectiveness of these techniques in order that the authorities find it easier to fund because um, historically that's been one of the issues with you know funding they want to um, they want to be able to prove the difference that these things are making um, yeah so the flow trustees are, are, are kind of really really powerful group of people who are um, some of us are professionals in the field so landscape architects and engineers and um, 
woodland experts and then there's also a kind of complementary group of people with expertise in things like communications and social media um, and finances and project management um, and we've worked very effectively together so far. Um, so I'm going to try and focus on some of our um, urban sudsy projects. There's a huge wealth of information on our website now, um, you know, running nearly nearly seven years now. Um, and, you know, do take a look at the website. There's, it's a huge resource and it's all freely available. Um, this is part of one of the early projects we did, um, which uh, 2B um, produced a resource of a kind of a suite of web pages called You Can Slow the Flow. Um, there's downloadable PDFs and all the information on the website. Um, there's some of it's targeted at schools and um, there's homes, there are um, public spaces. And um, yeah, this has kind of stood the test of time as a resource. We, we still use it regularly. And um, for example, um, one of our current projects is using it. Um, this is kind of hot off the press. It's not publicly available yet, but there'll be a launch in uh, November sometime. And it's a, a um, curriculum aligned set of lesson plans for key stage two and three. Um, we've re recently recruited some new trustees, two of whom are teachers. And so they've been able to produce these wonderful resources that are gonna you know, help teachers to um, just lift this up and use it in their lessons to sort of educate young people about sustainable drainage and NFM. Another of our fairly recent projects is um, called Opportunities Mapping. Um, so far we've done a pilot area in northern Mythamroyd and again um, Tooby and um, one of the other trustees who's a, a geotechnical engineer um, have parceled up the land into sort of you know a couple of streets or a couple of fields um, and we've done desktop exercise which we've then um, gone out and ground truth you know gone out and looked at every single site and on our website is a, a map with pop-ups um, so you can click on the area that you're interested in and see what we think you could be doing to slow the flow there um, so it's kind of it's plain English it's realistic um, to an extent, it's um, it, we haven't had any kind of you know survey, uh, you know underground surveys, uh, land ownership, anything like that. It's a kind of um, an idealistic vision of what could be, um, and we've put estimated volumes against all of that, which again is is a little bit finger in the air, but has allowed us um, to be produced a report on that data. So we took all of the estimated volumes and extrapolated it um, to think about what could be achieved if NFM and SUDS was present across the board in all of Coldsdale. And the figure we came up with was that we could be attenuating about 2 million cubic metres of water um, through NFM and SUDS, which is, you know, a significant number and um, sort of proved that that these interventions could have an impact on flood events. Um, and we've been gratified recently to learn that the uh, Environment Agency has also done a study, which is um, based on, you know, extensive flood modeling. Um, and, you know, they've they've come up with a more, um, more concrete kind of number uh, and they've, their numbers reflect ours. So we're pleased to be kind of um, proved right in that sense. That's all available on the website as well. And yeah, the, the Slow the Flow website is a very extensive resource. One of the other things we've got is a bank of case studies, um, which we're always glad to get more, more and more case studies. So do you know contribute if you've got any that you fancy sharing, particularly local ones to us, um, because they are really helpful in inspiring other people to do the same, you know, people copy one another's behavior and if they can see real people are managing to achieve this in real places um everyone's more inclined to give it a go we, we you know we're um, we have our own projects but we are kind of primarily accepting of that we can't do everything as a small volunteer and organization we need and you know for it to be effective we need everybody to be doing this everywhere 
um, is an image showing some of our blog posts. Uh, we have a blog, you can follow us. And again, there's so much um, great information there. There's um, the, there are kind of more general public facing articles. There are scientific and academic papers. Um, there's, you know, newsy things about what we're up to. Uh, and again, we welcome guest bloggers if anyone's interested. Um, anything to do with Suds and NFM, we're, we're keen to talk about. Um, the, the source um, project that jumps out at me there is um, an example of some of our other networking we do. We're um, closely engaged with the statutory bodies locally, um, as well as other community organisations and the contractors doing things on the ground. Um, so we attend lots of meetings with, um, you know, some of them are invited meetings, some of them are public meetings. Sometimes it's us presenting to the local women's institute or the scouts or something. Um, we've, we do we mentor other community groups across the country um, who are starting to set up and want to learn from what we've done. Um, and we get invited to speak to the likes of DEFRA and Offwart and uh, the Institute of Civil Engineers, um, sometimes online like this. Sometimes we take people to show them around um, some of what we've done in Calderdale. Oh, and I'm going to talk over these videos um, because it's just blinky music in the background. It's just um, to show the project that we've done this summer, uh, which was called the Slow the Flow Roadshow. Um, we, we got some funding to uh, take this the message um, in a wider way locally. And we had a marquee and some display boards and this interactive map that really you know, got kids involved in talking to us. And we took it around places like the Peace Hall and uh, local parks and libraries um, and any sort of community fairs going on. So we had a very busy summer um, taking this message to more people because, you know, we are always trying to find new ways to reach people. We, we've got a great social media following. We, um, we, you know, we're in touch with a lot of people already, but we want to make sure that we're not just preaching to the converted and that we're trying to help take this message more sort of mainstream. Um, this video shows the sort of event that I organised as part of that roadshow. Um, that was an evening do with presentations and food and networking. Um, we were lucky we had some great speakers. We had uh, Roger Noel from Sheffield City Council talking about their Greater Green scheme. Uh, we had um, Yorkshire Waters' Rachel Ray and she spoke about adoption of suds. And we had Ben Fenton from Coldsdale Council. Um, he's the NFM officer. And that's a, a post that, that we at the Slow the Flow are quite proud exists. We had to do with that. Um, because there's only a handful of councils in the country that have got an NFM officer. Um, and having that post in place has helped us to engage better with the council and to um, help them develop an NFM grant scheme, which can also be used for sustainable drainage projects. Um, and yeah, through that NFM grant scheme, we have seen um, many more projects than would otherwise have come forward. Uh, so finally, we were we were asked to talk a bit about um, what the award means to us. Um, we're very grateful. It's a you know it's a lovely thing to have, and Slow the Flow is lucky enough to be the recipient of several other awards. We're very proud of them all, and the kind of the awards, both local and national, and the media coverage that we get really helps us it, it helps us in a few ways it, it boosts our confidence and kind of um you know knowing that people are noticing what we're doing and thinking that we're doing good things um helps to drive us forward to do more um and it also really helps open doors in terms of people taking us seriously and wanting to speak to us um so when people like defera and off what see these um you know national and local recognitions that we've got um it really helps you know them approach us for those conversations um, and encourages people to take us seriously. Um, so that's just our contact information. Um, do get in touch, follow us on social media. And if you're so inclined, there's a new donate button on the website. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll pass you over to Bill. Right. Thank you, Amanda. 
Lovely. So um, I'm going to start off by talking about um, Westwold Slow the Flow. Um, it's a little bit different. I mean, the, the, interestingly, the name is the same. We were inspired by uh, Amanda and the work that, that uh, she and the, the team over there have been doing. Um, we, we sort of borrowed a bit of the name with their approval, stuck Westwolds on the front because that's where we are, which we'll explain in a moment. Um, and what we are is a catchment based informal partnership. So first of all, just to look at the catchment, um, East Yorkshire is on the map in front of you there. Uh, this is the uh, CABA catchment partnership map with all the main catchment water bodies. And guess what? We're not even on there um, <laughs> because we're not a, ma a major catchment. We are down there in the bottom left corner. We sit between the River Hull, which lies to the east of us, and uh, the River Funa and Market Wheaton Canal, which lies to the west of us. So we're a quite distinct catchment that runs down to the Humber. And uh, looking uh, here in, in Google Earth, we're looking due east. Um, so the River Humber is on the right hand side. Uh, the North Sea is at the top of the page behind the black panel. And uh, you're looking there in, in white at the catchment boundary with the main watercourses showing. And most importantly, the chalk wolds uh, lie above us and all of our watercourses or nearly all of our watercourses are chalk streams fed by springs, which is very significant. We'll come back to that in, in, in a moment. Um, but it is, it is fascinating, 65 square kilometers, a unique little catchment of its own that doesn't really connect into anything else except the Humber. And just one thing I'll, I'll mention while I'm there, uh, while we're on that slide, is the purple parts that you can see are the culverted sections of the various watercourses. So you can see that in many locations, the water doesn't flow naturally. For example, if you can see South Cave, just uh, right of center there, um, the, uh, um, the South Cave Beck, not quite sure what's going on on the screen there, South Cave Beck, um, uh, is heavily culverted through the middle of the village. Please move this window away from the shared application. Don't know quite what's going on there, Susan. I'll carry, right, I need to take control, yeah. Okay, thanks. So, um, in terms of the partnership itself, here's, here's a, a, a list of some of the, the partners that we have. Um, first of all, we've got flood risk agencies, uh, which you can see listed there. Waiting. All right. OK. Uh, then we have uh, uh, wildlife and uh, em environment groups. The uh, University of Hull. Uh, has been an excellent partner for us, um, particularly through their Flood Innovation Centre. We'll um, mention some of the ways they've been involved. And then uh, almost finally, the, the parish councils and community groups, newsletters and so on. And then a big plus for everyone else, because uh, we share the, uh, for example, the, the um, National Flood Forum um, uh, says, something like local people are experts in their local area. So as well as the technical experts that we've got, we believe very strongly in the importance of connecting te technical experts with local experts, people who know the farmers, the people who live next to the becks and so on, um, how they behave, what lives in them. We, we've been astounded to find out from local people what lives in our becks. Um, so this is the really important point about the partnership. And as to motivation, well, um, Amanda, uh, as she said, got involved with uh, Slow the Flow in Calderdale after the Boxing Day floods 2015, it just running into 2016. In 2019, uh, the shot on the left, that's our house in the background. 
um, behind the sandbags, behind the lovely firemen who helped um, prevent it from, from being worse than it might have been. But the area as a whole has had worse flooding. You'll know of the 2007 floods that affected Sheffield and the southwest so badly. They also affected Hull and East Riding very badly. And this on the right there, you can see a couple of shots um, from uh, 2007. And that was summer flooding, incidentally, as you, you may recall. So that was a big motivation for us to do something and to think as landscape architects, what, what can we do? How can we use our communication skills? How can we use our understanding of sustainable drainage and, and developing understanding of natural flood management to try to make a difference in our area? So, you know, many of the principles are, are similar to Slow the Flow in Calderdale. The way we've done it is, is slightly different. We started out just pre-lockdown pre with uh, a meeting in our local village hall, which attracted people from across the catchment because we did, did a bit of social media. Liz, Liz uh, helped, <laughs> helped us with the social media there. Um, of course, immediately we then go into lockdown and did an awful lot of this on a very regular basis, setting up technical groups and uh, a technical group and a steering group. So the steering group was more the parish councils and the flood risk agencies. The technical group has brought in more organisations, wildlife organisations, university, um, East Yorkshire Rivers Trust and so on. And during the course of the last couple of years, we have naturally set up a website. We've not been as clever at social media as um, Slow the Flow has, but we've sort of got our our core position there in terms of the, the, the website. We've developed GIS based mapping that shows where some of the main areas of concern are, the issues and the possible opportunities that relate to those. So if you go on our website and the links will be at the end of the presentation, um, you'll be able to find that mapping. And we thought it was very important to say, what's our position on all of this, to, to actually state, state our case. So uh, we developed a position statement which talked about why we needed to do what we needed to do, um, where we're doing it. So there's, there's another view of, of the, the catchment and the relationship to the wells and the, and the villages that the watercourses pass through. And a little bit about how we do it. Um, and you may spot there, we're borrowing a little bit from Slow the Flow in Calderdale. We've got a really good working relationship with Slow the Flow um, that has also fed into this document, an introduction to natural flood management. Again, this is on our website, uh, and I think it's on the Slow the Flow website. You, you'll uh, see the link at the end. And with this, we were aware there's a lot of guidance um, in this last year, there's been the um, Syria uh, guidance for, for natural flood management, but it, a lot of that guidance is quite technical, uh, quite involved. We wanted something that was quite simple and accessible, and I can't remember, this is 10 or 12 pages. And we talk about the reasons why we do what we do and uh, how it works. So the storm hydrograph there that you'll all be familiar with. Um, and again, lovely example of uh, uh, an intervention in Hardcastle Crags there by Slow the Flow. And then in fairly simple terms, trying to talk about the actual techniques uh, that, that we use, the benefits uh, that they bring about, how difficult they are to do. Uh, and this is based again on other work done by Environment Agency, but trying to present it in as simple a way as possible. Uh, and I should say, uh, not just Environment Agency, very, various rivers trusts as well. So just how it works in relatively simple terms. And as, as part of the work um, directed by ourselves, working with the technical uh, group and the strategic, and the um, uh, the steering group, we realised that what we needed to develop was um, strategic projects 
that are not in any one location, but uh, really trying to apply principles across the whole catchment um, and also site based uh, projects. But the strategic projects include uh, looking at the watercourse management and biodiversity because we have got these fabulous chalk streams. They're, um, uh, they're not unique in the UK, but they're very rare. Uh, they're very rare in the world uh, globally and uh, very, very important. So whilst we're thinking about flooding and watercourse management and how do we um, change things to improve the flooding situation, we also need to be very, very conscious of the biodiversity. Um, there's in the bottom right corner, there's a little bullhead, um, which... Uh, you know, we've seen various people identifying that those are in our streams, uh, along with trout and, and um, um, crayfish and all sorts of interesting uh, biodiversity. So one of the things that we will be doing is uh, trying to, again, create a, a management guide um, how for, uh, so that people are aware of their riparian responsibilities, but also how not to ruin the biodiversity in meeting their riparian responsibilities to manage the watercourses. Um, NFM feasibility is uh, a, 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 a tricky issue. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail here at the moment, just come back to it at the end. Agriculture, we're trying to work with our local farmers and we held a, an agriculture workshop online, which again, you can find all the um, presentations are in video format on the website. Data capture, really important. This has been mentioned a couple of times. It was in, in uh, Kerry's presentation and in Amanda's. Um, and just to the right or in the center of the screen, you can see an example of uh, rainfall and consequential um, sort of flooding and overtopping events. Uh, that's from publicly available data. We're working with the university to create our own data capture system with uh, river level and flow rate uh, monitors and also uh, weather stations, uh, one of which is being installed in a local school. And we want each of our schools to um, have their own weather station so they can access the, the data and think about that relationship between rainfall, storms, flooding and what we can do about it all. And finally, we're um, trying to work with uh, Yorkshire Water to understand the relationship between uh, surface water and wastewater. Uh, and it is a very close relationship in that surface water impacts on wastewater and can cause um, things like combined sewer overflows. Combined sewer, sewer overflows in turn impact on uh, surface water and water courses and affect uh, water quality. So that's a, a sort of an ongoing project. We have a range of site specific projects that we're developing and the extent to which we've been able to um, work into these, uh, progress them, depends very much on the landowners. And we've got differing degrees of success uh, and differing levels of, of um, sort of cooperation with landowners. Um, but we're, we're sort of pushing at uh, many doors. If they're not already open, we're trying to shove them just a little bit and, and see, see what we can do. But we are, importantly, we're working across the catchment so that all areas should see benefits. And um, yeah, our first year, we did a lot of voluntary work. Um, tens tens of thousands of uh, in terms of value of the time that we put into it but that has had the benefit that we've uh, subsequently attracted environment agency funding uh, that's coming through the east yorkshire rivers trust and helping to pay for our time uh, as landscape architects so we're not just having to do it on a voluntary basis and that enables it to be uh, enables us to move faster, really, um, rather than just seeing, you know, what we could do evenings and weekends. And um, I'll pretty much close on our biggest challenges, which is that uh, landowners and farmers are, and I think this will be common to people working in an NFM, you'll get a, a few who are very keen, can see this, this um, you know, the way that we've got to be doing things in the future in the face of climate change, but many who are reluctant, 
We were very optimistic that uh, ELMS, the Environmental Land Management uh, post-Brexit funding, would make a big difference to uh, our um, uh, to the attitude of farmers. And uh, what we're what we're now finding, of course, is that ELMS there's a big question mark over it. And the other thing that we need to work out is responsibility for design and long-term management. Um, I think I've fairly dramatically overrun, so I'll hand on to uh, Liz <laughs> to come in and talk about 2B. Hello. Um, this is the 2B team. You've already heard from Amanda, who's on the left, and Bill, who's on the right. And there's me next to Bill and our newest recruit, who's with, been with us uh, about 18 months now, is Hannah, uh, came to us as a student. Um, and we've been we've been trying to progress and encourage people to use SUDS um, and SUDS approaches in landscape work um, for well over a decade now. Um, it's not always been a great success, and we've got some that we we think fondly of as misses. Um, one of a, an early miss was a, a project at Hull University where um, we were asked to, to do a, a planting scheme and we said, well, what about suds? Um, so we were brought in far too late, um, but we came up with a proposal, which the benefit for us was it got costed. Um, and even though it didn't actually go to fruition um, because of timings and all sorts of other reasons, um, but it did sh show that we, um, could have saved a six million pound project, a hundred thousand pounds, which we thought was not an insignificant sum. And we bandy it around on a regular basis. Um, another near miss was a, a, a housing scheme um, where the developer was interested, but the local parish council um, and the county council and interestingly, the Environment Agency were all slightly against it. Um, but the biggest killer was the fact that the uh, County Council said they were not prepared to adopt any land that was used um, in any flooding capacity or drainage capacity. And if it was likely to get um, be used as an attenuation base, then that was it, big no. And so that died a death. Um, and then uh, uh, an industrial unit in, in Hull was very interested in, in improving biodiversity. And also um, when we started talking to them about the benefits of suds uh, and biodiversity as a combined thing, they were quite interested in it all. Uh, but that project has um, fallen by the way because they had a change of heart as to how they were working with that particular site and they were thinking about extending the building and one mm. thing and another so that one's fallen by the way um and then a, a little scheme that uh, that 2b picked up um sort of via um slow the flow really um this is a um a, a car park in uh, in mythenroyd uh, which was being used as an environment agency site compound so it gave the community um, centre the opportunity to rethink its car park. Um, we came up with um, some proposals. Um, it was all going to have to wait until the Environment Agency cleared the site. Um, and we're not really too sure what's happened with it <laughs> since. Um, but we have had one or two um, hits, if you like. Um, a, a mental health unit, this is going back to the early 2012 somewhere around, around there where we were called in to help um, redevelop a mental health unit um, and look at the landscape and needless to say we said what about suds and we managed to influence the car park design um, turn it into a porous surface uh, and they were happy to have an attenuation basin which is what you see in front of you and a swale that runs down the side of the car park and the courtyard gardens were sort of fairly traditional um, landscape. Um, and this doesn't look like a sud scheme at all, but it is. <laughs> um, this is at the Siemens factory in, in Hull, um, down by the dock. Um, they'd spent a lot of money 
doing their their factory and all the rest of it and suddenly realized that the office block didn't have um, any decent landscape so um, I was called in and um, we came up with this scheme which is a completely porous hard surface to enable once the trees and everything have, have developed it will enable office workers to be able to come out and use this space it's a pretty windy exposed space but um, I'm hoping that as the surface is completely porous the trees will always get their water and they should develop um, and uh, they're going to bring seats out and yeah so on. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right um, and then uh, another little joint exercise with uh, slow the flow in Calderdale this is at Hebden Bridge Town Hall um, they wanted to use their courtyard for the cafe, uh, but they had issues with um, water. And we we suggested that um, rain gardens could be created and they could become an educational resource. Um, so this is the team. And we actually had a little bit of um, some members of our staff got involved with um, building with with some volunteers the um, rain gardens and planting them up and then the whole thing was opened by the mayor um, and it was uh, I understand it was a, a, a great success uh, on its on its opening day um, and I've just realized the watering can matches the still be in the background marvelous. Um, <laughs> and finally um, a, a scheme that uh, Bill really is working on in the edge of the Lake District where he was called in by the developer who was having trouble um, with uh, parts of the team and he wanted to um, have a more sustainable approach to the landscape um, and Bill needless to say proposed thinking about the site from a, a, a Suds point of view and bringing in biodiversity at the same time. And it's this sort of a mixture of private housing and some special uh, care um, holiday units, uh, as well as a community hub. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a diverse um, sort of project. And finally, we, we use the four pillars of SUDS all the time. Um, we think it's really important and we sneak it in even if <laughs> the client doesn't realize we're doing it if we've 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 muted the point and they've they've knocked it back and we 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 give up sort of making a big thing of it we'll still sneak it in because it's in the back of our heads all the time um and <coughs> we we strongly believe that it has a beneficial um, impact on cost, keeping everything on the surface and the maintenance side of things. It's just normal landscape maintenance. And for us, it gives a real purpose for landscape. Not only is it there for aesthetic purposes, but it's there to um, promote biodiversity and help with climate change and, and all the other beneficial effects. Um, and uh, you know, from for our point from our point of view, having been given the the award, it's given us a, a lot more confidence to um, to go out there and promote it even further, um, and it gives us a bit of credibility with people who, up to now, sort of, what do you know about this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we'd like to thank Jackie and Brian for for nominating us. Um, because we're not actually very good at recognizing the fact that we're um, we're particularly different from anybody else. So we we feel that we, we're all trying hard to to do something for our environment um, in all in our different ways, and it's um, been a fantastic pleasure to be part of this and to have won the award. Absolutely, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Oh, and this finally. Oh, yeah. so our contact details if anyone wants to get in touch with us is the the two slow the flows and two b thank you thanks louise fantastic thanks very much amanda bill and elizabeth so this brings us to our expert panel if i could invite all our speakers to turn on their webcams and microphones phil Kerry. 
Michael, Amanda, Bill and Elizabeth. We've received some interesting questions from the audience. If you've not submitted a question and you have one, now's the time to do so. Uh, we've had some great comments as well. I've just seen one come through. <laughs> Super presentations of excellent work and well-deserved awards, and that's from the Chair of the Australian. So thank you for that, and well done, everyone. Um, I've got 10 questions in the Q&A box. I've uh, ordered them in terms of voting so i'll start with the with the one that's got the most thumbs up um and this is to kerry um and it's from david bernan brassfield what was the property owner's incentive for doing this project and how was it financed return on investment will be important to have such projects duplicated at scale um, so the short answer to that is I can't recall the specifics of the funding mechanisms that are in place, so I don't want to give you any incorrect, incorrect information, but I know the crematorium did obtain funding from the council via a specific bereavement services restructuring fund, um, which sort of helped them get going, but I don't, I'm afraid I don't know any details beyond that. Um, what I can tell you is that, I mean, the original crematorium was built in the 60s where the percentage of people using promotion services were a lot less. Um, now it's around 80% 80 um, cremation so over, over burials. Um, and the crematorium at the time was identified as being 50% efficient in terms of the infrastructure and staff uh, numbers, which created a bottleneck in terms of what services they could provide. So there's probably a, a very relatively easy analysis to be done there. Uh, comparing the, the requests for services they were getting um, versus that potential return. And that was the incentive, basically, that they could be more efficient and hold more services on a daily basis. Um, <coughs> dramatically different from the norm in terms of the, the cost of that. Um, I'll go out on a limb and say that we probably saved the scheme money by moving away from a traditional suds, uh, traditional drainage network in favour of a SUDS network. Um, but obviously the the building and the um the landscaping were obviously high quality so that, that's a different story um yeah thanks carrie sorry about the uh background yeah, that's okay <laughs> um so the next question i've got uh with lots of votes is uh for phil and it's from andrew keen did you get any assistance from united utilities on the scheme seeing as they benefit from your innovative solution in terms of water quantity and peak flow to the sewer? Uh, yes, we did. We, we involved United Utilities from uh, one of the first, uh, when we first got involved in this project with Bruntwood. So we approached, um, it was uh, Sophie Tucker at the time, but um, Johnny Phillips has taken over from her now. Um, so we approached Sophie and we worked, we worked really closely with Sophie and one of the, the things that we're currently doing for United Utilities is where they've got access to all the data because there's the the smart solution. All the data is currently in the web and uh, it, well in the cloud and is ready to go. So what we're doing is we're um, building up an entire year's worth of information to prove the the concept. And one of the things we noticed um, is uh, the the difference in the rainfall and how the system works between summer and winter. So as part of our um, work for United Utilities, it's allowed us to sharpen up the system because the rainfall patterns are different in winter and also you don't have as much of the evapotranspiration as you would do in the summer. So uh, we've actually got two modelling engines working at the same time um, and the system flips between summer and winter mode. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I've got another one for you as well. Um, John Paul Simmons, great project. Are residents of Manchester able to visit or see the Blue Roof? The initial idea was to have um, benches and other ability for people who were working within the block zone to, um, to go up and visit. However, 
the the weight loading of the roof means that no more than seven people are allowed on top of that roof at any one time. And the structural engineer has been very, very specific about it. Seven, no more, no, uh, sorry, no more, ideally less. So um, unfortunately, we can't get any um, any sort of locals up there. However, Bruntwood themselves completely bought into this system and really like it. And they're developing another one in another city. Um, and this one, they've got a stronger roof. So this one's going to be attached to part of the cafe so people can come and go um, onto the roof and use it as, as a dining area and when the weather's nice. I have to get a periscope or something. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Um, so the next question is for Michael and it's from Jackie Giaznito. Um, she says, love it and very inspiring. I'm interested in the catchment wide approach and how the flood modeling showed that distributing green infrastructure alleviated the flooding. Was the catchment strategy uh, a flood and coastal erosion management project? Did the surface water flood risk element qualify for any grant in aid? Uh, yeah, I was frantically trying to find out um, the answers to this because uh, I think it was done by other members of my team, but I don't believe it was part of um, the flood and coastal um, bits. And we didn't apply for any funding from the grant in aid because uh, basically where we got the funding from our housing team and section 106 because they developed literally opposite um, and they surprise surprise couldn't install sustainable drainage um, we got a lot of funding from section 106 and it all happened during the peak of covid so funding avenues and that um, wasn't actually looked at because uh, we one we didn't have time to deliver um, and look into all of them and two we had we had the funding already sort of in place so um, but I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure about the uh, the catchment approach, unfortunately. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, I do have another quick one for you. I think just bear with me. It's quite hard to keep track of the. Uh, I it's from Daniel Daniel Race. I would work at Thames Water. Would it be helpful if you? if we direct developers to your case studies when replying to pre-planning inquiries for Enfield, if so, do you have a page on your website with these examples, please? So we don't have a page yet. We are working on a page. So we're trying to put together our own section on the Enfield Council website, all to do with all of the projects we do, the wetlands, the rain gardens and, and things like that. Um, obviously the case study is available on the Sustrains website. So, you can direct them to that. Um, but once we've got that website up and running, unfortunately, as we are a local authority, nothing is that quick in getting up and running. So we're hoping that at some stage in, in next year, we should have a, a dedicated sort of portal on the Enfield Council website, which sort of delivers all the information about what we do, why we do, and gives some good case studies. But at the minute, there isn't anything as such. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I've got a question for Amanda Bill and Elizabeth from David Byrne and Brassfield. In these kinds of projects where you're working <clears throat> and causing effects across property boundaries, I suppose everyone is happy as long as things are going according to plan. Have you encountered issues with contractual requirements or risk exposure for those implementing the in interventions? I've, I've Do you want to take course. this, step? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll I'll start with the with the West Walls point of view. I think you probably have some interesting thoughts from like Hardcastle Crags as well, Amanda. Um, it it is an issue that concerns us um, in particular because we are not a local authority, um, so we don't kind of have that heft of a local authority behind us. We have local authorities as part of the partnership, and. Um, one of the things, one of the strategic projects that I skipped over fairly quickly was the um, NFM feasibility. And one of the biggest concerns there that we need to address with uh, our lead local flood authority, environment agency, Yorkshire Water, um, and local landowners is uh, who takes responsibility 
for um, both the design and the management of the NFM interventions. Um, and we don't have an easy answer for that yet, but it's interesting. We, we, we have had a, um, a meeting with that group and uh, Chris Utley from Stroud, who a number of you will, will know, he's worked for the Environment Agency and he's um, currently developing uh, NFM extensively in the Stroud area. And his take is, do you know what? The risk level is really, really low because you've got this many, many uh, small interventions across a big area. So you don't really get into that kind of Reservoirs Act, um, uh, you know, potential collapse uh, scenario. So, um, yeah, we, it's a question that we've we've still got to answer in order to progress in, in what we're doing. But I know uh, Amanda Calderdale does it a little bit differently or slow the flow. Yeah, well, I was going to say the same sort of thing, Bill. Yeah, it's a, you know because each intervention is comparatively small. You know, at, at Harcastle Crags, for instance, if one of the leaky dams were to fail or move or something, it wouldn't go very far. It would get lodged against other trees in the woodland and it wouldn't have a significant effect in itself on the downstream situation because, the, you know, one of the wonderful things about NFM and SUDS is that, it, you know, it's a a combined effort of a lot of little interventions having a big effect so yeah we haven't had to worry too much um i think it's worth in the same breath talking about one of the big issues we have had which is some um, insurance as a community group trying to install the flood you know interventions we haven't been able to get insurance so it's one of the reasons that it's been wonderful for us to work with our castle crags because we're working under the national trust insurance um, and one of our upcoming project that we're, we're trying to set up at the moment is with the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. And similarly, we can use their insurance. But um, yeah, insurance uh, insurers are very reluctant to touch us with a barge pole because they because they haven't understood the low risk nature of it yet. Um, and they see it as a you know flood management project. Um, and yeah, so we need a greater understanding generally, particularly by the insurers of the lowest nature of it yeah yeah i just remembered a, a, a scheme that we actually um being west walls slow the flow and dragging our local county council in um and they have they started out being slightly suspicious of our motives and what we were up to and everything um but they they've as they've gone on and stayed engaged um they've realized what an asset we can be because we've got the connections into the community and they, they they've starting to understand this idea that actually local people know the, their own area the best um and so they uh, have brought forward a scheme which actually which benefits us really um and 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 a, and a section of our village um but instead of just doing it they came and said uh what do you think about it and and actually uh bill went out on site with them and got uh local um biggish landowners who um would be impacted on it uh by it uh, to to sort of come out and talk um and the project is at the pro um, uh, it's going for funding at the moment mm. Um, so we're waiting to hear how that's going to, going on, but we're hoping that that will happen and that we'll start to see something on the ground uh, for this village. And and um, one of the other villages is very active and, and has a, a fair amount of land owning of its own. So we're hoping to be seeing things in that area as well. So, you know, it's slowly, slowly, and we're hoping that as people start to see things happening and, and it's nothing too devastating um, that they'll they'll get on board and and understand the value um, yeah yeah I think uh, thanks all I think you've probably seen in the chat there's a comment from Brian Smith saying who amongst other things says being invited to off what to present on your work and advise what's needed from regulators, government and businesses to make it happen is great testament to your work. And um, 
he's congratulates you on your award and, Thank and you, Brian. Having uh, it was an interesting <laughs> yeah it was an interesting exercise that to to sort for, for off what to normally deal with the water companies uh to to see another angle <laughs> around uh water management and and indeed how how we uh, relate to the water companies in, in our own ways so yeah it was really useful thank you um <clears throat> brian's also commented um on, on your project kerry and saying it's very sensitive design and sympathetic to the site the use on water on the site was very good with water having spiritual aspects for many as well as calming along with green infrastructure um and i have a question for you from uh, another brian brian darcy who asks who pays for the monitoring um i'm assuming that's relating to sort of ongoing maintenance rather than sort of flow monitoring so i'll answer to that effect but um the crematorium have uh, a set of groundsmen basically that do as you can imagine there's quite a big area to maintain uh every day um so they are basically paid staff as part of the crematorium and they maintain it in line with the maintenance schedule for the for the such devices we've, we've given them um and that's been produced via planning um so that's that's how it's it's maintained and the crematorium itself pay the staff um, thank you. So, Louise, I'll just just add in there on that question of of uh, monitoring. Um, the university, Hull University, have been amazing uh, within our project, and they've brought great sort of technical expertise to bear. They, <laughs> it's quite interesting, Liz. Liz. Um, showed that first uh, scheme at Hull University, which was about 2014, and we did have an uphill struggle. Uh, the university were kind of kind of willing, but, you know, not all of the uh, design team were willing to go along with it. And now, uh, what are we, six, eight years later, they've had other SUDS schemes implemented elsewhere, and they're incredibly proud. They've created the thing called the SUDS Lab, across the university campus uh, and they're they're closely monitoring uh, how water behaves across the the sort of urban framework of the campus but then that the knowledge that they've acquired there they're now applying uh, on our project on west worlds in in um an integrated network of um as i said earlier on river flow and level monitoring combined with weather stations all of which is going to be available online. So, you know, this is stuff that we we kind of had an idea at the outset that we wanted to do data capture and monitoring. No, no idea how to do it. And the university have become more and more involved and come up with, with great um, propositions. So in answer to the particular question, in our case, it'll be the university who continue to do that monitoring. I know there's been, I think, um, was it Lam Lambsdrove in in uh, Cambridge? I think the university was involved in that. So it's it's a really good option uh, to to try to get universities with water management expertise involved in projects if you can. Well, they use yeah. their students as well. Yeah. Um, it's a great learning resource for their students to actually go out and see things on the ground that are working, as well as um, studying it theoretically. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd just add from, from the Slow the Flow Coldale point of view, yeah, it's really encouraging how many students are interested, you know, we're constantly getting invited to do um, in, interviews for dissertations and things. Um, and I, we, we've always found it a bit sort of frustrating that it's a lot of undergraduate level. So, you know, people don't have that long term mm. um, project to kind of really, really gather the data that we need. But we've, we've now got um, some Slow the Flow and partners funded um, master's research projects ongoing. Um, I think it's Sam Townsend, who's on um, in the audience today, is one of our uh, bursary recipients, and he's just starting a new project um, monitoring invertebrates, I think, at um, Howcastle Crags. And yeah, one of the things that at, at Slow the Flow we're particularly interested in is making that research publicly available because often you know research project kind of could get academically published and they're not available publicly so again on our blog page you'll 
see uh, some of Sam's um, work and other people who have done research projects and we try and encourage them to do blog posts for us and, and help to publicise their findings. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, the, the Suds Lap at Hull is great. They also won an award and uh, we went to yes, visit them on, uh, yeah. on Friday and they're doing some really good things. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to have to close the session. We've got some questions not answered yet, but we'll endeavour to respond to any that have not been covered. Um, if you've got any additional questions, please contact the Sustrain team. Thank you to everyone who's joined us for today. And thank you, Phil, Kerry, Michael, Amanda, Bill and Elizabeth for your valuable contributions. We really enjoyed uh, it. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Good. Um, we will we'll include to a, a link to a survey in the post event email, which will be sent shortly, shortly and um, grateful for your feedback on that. Uh, Sustrain is also running a mini survey and we'd be grateful for your insights, just five minutes to complete on a, on a, a forms um, a form. <laughs> uh, upcoming events through Sustrain, um, 23rd and 24th of November will be at Floodex. We have a stand and the Suds Theatre. Um, with we're looking at the subject of smarter suds. So I might actually be in contact with some of the speakers today to see if they might be interested in contributing. Um, 28th of November, we have a webinar on nutrient neutrality. And on the 7th of December, we've got a Blue Boon Infrastructure Conference. Finally, if you are interested in our suds training courses or would like to help support the work of Sustrain, please contact me or my colleague, Adrian. And thank you again also to our Sustrain partners and supporters for their support in our ongoing programme of research and webinars. Um, yeah, and so thank you everyone for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.